there were a couple of things that I have compromised in on in my life, and you know, compromise never leaves you feeling okay. Um, I always feel bad about compromise, but uh, there are a couple things I've compromised on that I just have to live with, and um, I don't know what to do about. And most things, my wife will tell you, I'm an uncompromising personality. Most things, if uh, if it's not right, and I know it's not right, then it's not going to happen uh, because it's just it's it's it. What you pay for with your conscience and everything else in life is just not worth whatever you think it would have cost you not to compromise. Really? Compromise or doing right always cost. Well, I said that serious, made that serious statement to say something that's not entirely serious. There are two things that I, when we started our ministry, I told Brother Chris we wouldn't ever do. One of them was to let him sing or lead singing. And I said, Brother Chris, I'm never going to let you. And I told you this, didn't I? I said, you can't lead singing in our church, right? He said, I can lead the singing. I said, no. And um, I, tried, I tried playing the piano. My wife didn't play the piano at that time. In our first service, she had started playing. And so I tried playing the piano and leading singing, following that up with announcements and preaching, and I uh, realized it just wasn't very practical to do it that way. And I compromised, and... Uh, and now look what we have. You know, we got uh, we have pretty good congregational singing. I'll tell you something. I do have always known is that somebody's got a spirit to praise the Lord, and they'll beller it as uh, brother uh, has said all week. Brother CT said all week long. He said they're willing to beller. Then it's going to be good singing. I'll tell you something. I have downloaded on my computer somewhere on my telephone um, pretty much all the songs that old Lester Roloff used to sing. Yeah. He's the worst singer ever, wasn't he? Probably. Not very good. He's probably <laughs> probably the worst ever. But he's the, I would tell you something. You love to hear him. I I can't stand listening to most music. I'll tell you, just most music I just turn off because it just um, I'd rather have silence. Uh, but but Lester Roloff, when I want to listen to something, I turn on Lester Roloff, man. I bellow right along with him. And <laughs> I was I had a little bit of music training in high school, and um, and I've just about gotten it all gone. I've I've just about gotten it completely out of me, and uh, just to where I can beller right along with everybody else. It's nice. Hey, you folks sound good, and I, I have learned something, and that is that with when people love the Lord and they're in a right relationship with Him, it's in their heart, and when it's in their heart, it comes out their mouth That's when it's right. time to worship and to praise Him. And so uh, I don't care what you sound like, you just sing at the top of your lungs. Yes. And of course, try to drown Brother Chris out. Please do that. Yeah. Uh, that it's one of his. It's one of the things that makes him. A really good song later is everybody's like, man, somebody's got to do something. They're all trying, you know. But uh, but if you ever listen to a recording of our services or song services, you know that they tried in vain. Uh, he had he had the microphone. We shut it off, and he still got it in there somehow. So I love Brother Chris, don't you? Amen. He's good at what he does. So the other thing is the the guys hiding behind the sound booth. I said, you know, we're not going to do. I don't know how we ever ended up with. I tried to build something that was not conducive like you know how people get in the sound booth right you know and they've got their uh, they've got their lunch and dinner and everything I, I heard the sound men aren't even saved I heard that you know that there's you know yeah it, it's somewhere yeah like, there's something and they're all named Tony uh, it's funny they, they're all named Tony and they all are just they're shady characters and uh, but we got Tony over there Tony don't hide or I'll holler at you during the service. I don't know why I'm picking on Chris and Tony today, but Chris is glad to be in that camp, huh? The Tony crowd. We're in Luke chapter 6, and um, we might as well just start reading from verse 27 and read down to chapter 16. And ver I'm kidding. Verse 27, we'll read down to uh, verse 38. But I say unto you which hear... Love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and if him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if you love them which love you, what thank have ye for sinners also love those that love them? <laughs> and if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? 
For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners and receive as much again. But love ye your enemies and do good. And lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind. Mm. Let's read that again. For he is kind yes. unto the unthankful and to the evil. Yes. Mm. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure. Pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured again. We'll pray. Heavenly Father, Help us to understand this passage of Scripture. And Father, where difficult, help us to simply believe it. And Lord, I ask that you would help us as we are concluding what our heart's attitude ought to be toward missions. And Lord, specifically, what you have for Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church right now. Help us to see, help us to see from your word what God is like. And help us to see as his children, what his offspring ought to be like. Lord, I just ask that this year you would show us how to be the kind of a church that when people read Luke chapter 6, they'd say that's the kind of church Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church is. And it'd be true. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I love sarcasm. You folks know that. I'm very, very sarcastic. Matter of fact, sometimes when people don't know me, um, I've been known to be overly sarcastic. And, and because of that, I uh, have, have said things and, and people take me wrong sometimes. Let me just offer you some advice that will help me in life. Notice I didn't say it will help you, but it will help me in life. Um, if you think uh, that I've said something that offends you, just say, well, he's probably just being sarcastic. And believe that. And love me anyway. Amen. Say, well, he's just got to be kidding about that. I know he can't be serious. If I say I'm really serious about it, then just still believe he's not serious. And uh, I'm kidding about that. Uh, but honestly, uh, one of the things that I appreciate in the Scripture, not just the words of Christ, but I appreciate the direct manner of speaking that Christ had. Yes. Somebody said, "Make." you ever had a statement that it, it was a quote? It just got said over and over and over again because it said so well and it said so much more than just a couple words could say. Sometimes a very trite statement can just, just say it all. I mean, um, sometimes a word is loaded. You know, it just, it's just full. Love. Man, a, a believer... The word love, when you are thinking of the word love and you're thinking of what it is in the Bible, what it is according to Christ, and the way that it's manifested, that simple word, that simple word just means so much. And sometimes a statement or a phrase will be made and it just means a whole lot. And there are a couple of those in this passage of Scripture. There's one verse that we didn't read tonight, verse 26. And uh, Jesus is in the, in the, of course, in the Beatitudes here, he's listing the woes. In verse 26, he says, Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. And I think of some specific instances. You remember the king of Israel and the king of Judah when they were thinking about going to war together? King of Judah shouldn't have been there at all with that <coughs> wicked king. Yeah. And uh, so he comes, and he's, here he is with this wicked king. And he says, let's, get, let's find out whether or not we should go up to war. Let's ask God's will. In other words, they had already made a decision. They're going to go to war together. But now they're going to ask God whether or not he was going to bless it. It's also interesting that even though they asked God whether or not he was going to bless it, it had nothing to do with whether or not they were going to do it. Yeah. They were going to do it either way. But they wanted to know, hey, uh, maybe just a little bit of fortune telling you, hey, is it, how, ba how bad or how good is this going to be? We're going to find out. And you remember... Uh, <laughs> When they called the prophets, and the prophets said, Hey, go up, you're going to be blessed, and it's going to be wonderful, you're going to have great victory, and God's going to do this and this and this and this. And the king of Judah said, He said, Isn't there, Is there a real prophet in, around here? And it was, it's, a king, it's King Ahab, right? And king Ahab says, He says, There is, but I hate him. Yeah. 
He said, because he doesn't speak well of me. He always prophesies evil concerning me. So they said, well, fetch him out anyway. I know this isn't, this isn't quite an exact quote. They said, fetch him out anyway. And he brought him out. And he prophesied. And he said, go up. You're going to have great victory. And everything's going to go great. And you're going to have, I mean, God's going to bless you. And you're going to have a nice time. And uh, you're going to get to, um, you know, torture all the innocents and just have, have yourself a heyday at war. And that's sarcasm there. And so Ahab said, he said, How long shall I adjure thee that they tell me nothing that thou tell me nothing but the truth? He says, You're lying to me. And of course the prophet and the reason he lied to him is because he's not interested in the truth. Right. I want to make a point to you. I want to say something that this passage of scripture sets us up for right at the beginning. <clears throat> Friend, if you're what you're going to do is what you're going to do anyway. Truth or no truth means nothing to you. It's not going to make any difference in your life, period. Right. And that's exactly what Jesus kindly said. He said, watch out when people think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yeah. And he's not talking just to preachers. He's talking to believers. By the way, this is not a passage of the Scripture that tells how to be saved. And you can tell that to John MacArthur and, and John yeah. Piper and whoever else that thinks that the Beatitudes are the Gospel. They're how people that are disciples of the Lord Jesus or who are believers ought to live. This is how this is God's way in the life of everybody that knows God. This is how people ought to live, not how people are saved. Right. And so the warning here is, woe to you. You better watch out or you have impending doom or destruction when men speak well of you. When people say, hey, boy, those people at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, aren't they great? The fact of the matter is if someone were to say that people at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church were great, they'd be lying. And that's the truth. You say, Pastor, you don't think very much of us. No, the fact of the matter is I think a great deal of our Savior. And there's nothing great about any person. All have sinned and come short of the glory yes. of God. Everything that we are as believers is as a result of the benefits of the grace of God toward us. And so we're not great. Now you say, Pastor, but God uses people in great ways. He sure does. By His grace. Mm -hmm. And His grace is His power, it's His ability, and it's His glory that, you, that, that, uh, that it belongs to Him. And so when people are giving you glory, you better look out because first of all, it's not yours. Right. And secondly, you're just their false prophet. In other words, that's what the Scripture is saying. saying. Not only do people not even want to hear the truth, but if people that don't want to hear the truth like you, that says a lot about you, says either you're a false prophet or you're satisfactory. And that would be, um, if you have any character and if you have any desire for righteousness, then that would be something that would ought to bother anybody. Well, then Jesus moves into a blessing passage. He's in a woe portion of the Scripture here. He moves into a blessing passage. And I just want to tell you something. What I want is God's blessing in my life. And what I want as pastor of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church is God's blessing on this ministry. Now, I want to define that because so many times when we talk about blessing, uh, everybody's on a different channel. And you're talking about the same things, but you're not talk you're, you're using the same words, but you're not talking about the same thing. And so I just want to define God's blessing. You know what God's blessing is? His presence. You know, Brother Chris and I studied, uh, we studied grace a while back. And we just looked at grace in context. And, and we sat in my office, and for a couple of hours, we looked at grace in every context in the Bible. You know, we found out grace really, I mean, just a good simple definition for grace was, it is God's presence. It's just God's there. Amen. God's there. You ever been in God's presence? <laughs> you ever been, I mean, God's there? And uh, when God's grace is with you, that means God's presence is with you. You ever been in a place and you just felt like, man, you know what? Uh, what happened there, we were in the presence of God. God's grace was there. His graciousness was there. And I just want to tell you something. If Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church is not blessed with God's grace, we don't have God's presence among us, then we're no different than anybody or anything else. Amen. And uh, if people think, uh, if people are praising us and God's blessing is not on us, then friend, uh, we just as well shut the doors and we just as well quit trying to do anything at all because it's a waste. Amen. We need God's blessing. And so now we're in a passage of Scripture that begins to talk about blessing and then it talks about things that ought to be in the life of a believer in order to have God's blessing. And so we'll just run through them very quickly and we'll get to the one point, which is that you need to give. 
Okay? Now you know where I'm going, so you don't have to worry about it. Verse 28. Bless them that curse you, and the Bible says, and pray for them which despitefully use you. Now we're going, we're in a series of hard sayings. In other words, there are things that aren't easy to this hard saying. What's a hard saying? Well, you remember Jesus when he told the rich young ruler, the rich young man, he said, Go and sell all your goods and feed them to the poor and come be my disciple and follow me. Go get get rid of all your stuff and come follow me. And the disciples said, That's a hard saying. Do you remember when Jesus told um, he told he told the Pharisees that they had that, that God didn't allow for divorce. And the disciples at the end of that said, that's a hard saying. You've got to stay married to your wife. It's a hard saying. <laughs> uh, now, I'm being a little funny there, but that is a, an actual biblical example. And if you don't believe me, you can read it. It's in the Bible. I found it there, and I liked it. Well, anyway, and by the way, not because of my wife smiling back there, so she knows. She knows that... Uh, she knows who it's a hard saying for at our house. <laughs> well, anyway, so it's a hard saying. The uh, and they, these would be these sayings would not be easy. Matter of fact, they're such hard sayings that people that are considering Christianity often bring this up to me and ask me about it. Many times, Christians that are going through hard times and don't want to do what the Scripture says bring it up to me and ask me, "Well, when the Bible says this, what does it mean?" I always respond by saying, "Well, tell me what it says." And then I say, well, now tell me what you think it means. And then <laughs> I say, well, that, if it doesn't mean what it says, then, then what does it mean? Well, it means what it says here. That's what I'm saying. It's a hard saying that means what it says, and it's not easy. Okay, it says, bless them which curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. You ever been used? Yes. You ever found out that, that when you were sincere and you, you were involved in a situation, and you really, as God knows your heart, you were right? And you were doing right by somebody, and then you found out that they just kind of walked all over you and made uh, made you as though you were nothing and used you. The Bible says when people do that, that you are to bless them that despitefully use you. In other words, not just use you, but use you in a in a way that they despise you while they're doing it. Like, oh, this guy, he's going to be a good Christian. And he's going to do the right thing, and I'm going to take full advantage of it and mock him and laugh at him the whole time he does it. You're done the right thing, and the person that you're doing right by were doing the wrong thing. And the whole time you're doing right, they knew they were wrong, they knew you were right, and they were taking advantage, and they thought it was funny. And they thought, well, hey, you say, Pastor, yes, I've been there. Most people have. And the Bible says your response is to bless them that despitefully use you. And the hand that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. So here's a guy, and, and uh, he took something from me that didn't belong. He took my facial comfort. So he smote me on the cheek, and so I turned to the other cheek. And you say, Pastor, what's that mean? It means if somebody, if somebody smites you on the cheek, turn to the other cheek. That's what it means. That's what it says, what it means. And I just I haven't been able to uh, explain it out of the Bible, so we'll just leave it there. Um, and to him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. So here's a guy who took advantage of you, and now he wants to take more advantage, and you just say, well, okay. You say, Pastor, a man can't afford to live that way. I'm about to prove to you that you can. Pastor, a guy can't afford to live this way. People take all your stuff. You know what you have? You don't have anything. People use you up. There's nothing left to be used up. Okay, let's read down. Let's finish. Let's get to our point. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. So, now I'm not talking about a person who's indigent and is unwilling uh, to be responsible in life, and they tell you you're not a good Christian if uh, if you don't give them your money or give them whatever. You give me this or you're not a good Christian. Well, that's not what the passage of Scripture here is saying, but it is saying very plainly that if somebody asks you for something, and of course the, the, uh, further on we find that the, there's a qualification even of asked that have need. If somebody needs something and they ask you for it, and you've got to give it to them. That's what the Bible says. Say, Pastor, you know, that would be easy for you, but the difference between me and you is I've got quite a lot. And if people started asking me for things, there'd be no end to what they'd ask me for. We're going to come to that in just a minute. You hold that thought. Uh, As ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Now, this is an interesting one because there's a little bit of benefit in this one. Now, the, you know, a guy smacks you on the face, turn around, let him smack you on the other side. Well, you know, I mean, it, it might help some of our looks. But for the most part, I don't see any benefit in it. Uh, if somebody takes your coat give them, or your cloak, give them your coat. If somebody wants something you've got, give it to them. 
there's nothing that benefits us in this yet uh, that we can see in our passage. And that, right. that's what I want to get to. I want to get to our point. But now here's one that says treat people like you want to be treated. And if you want to be treated well, then that's how you treat them. And the idea here is you're treating them in the hopes that the same treatment will be towards you that you have treated them. Has anybody ever here been nice and not had it returned, though? Anybody ever done something good and not had it? Had it done? I don't believe you. Let's move on. <laughs> I, I'm going to prove that just about. I set you up. For if you love them which love you, uh, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. Okay, if you love people that love you, you know, you want a Scooby snack, that's what it says here. What do you, what do you want? You know, they love you, you love them, you both get something. And people usually give to get normally. Um, if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? Man, there are some people, and I just don't want things from them because I just know. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, hey, Pastor, would you like And No, I wouldn't. No, sir, I know that if I take that, it'll cost me so dearly. I, when I went to seminary, I'm thinking of an individual that, man, I'm telling you something, he was always setting people up to owe him favors and different things. He just always wanted people to owe him. Mm. And he just, he's like, I'm going to do this for you. He'd always remind you that he'd done it. So that, uh, you know, hey, Brother Price, do you think maybe you could? And it just seemed like I always had way more to give than he did. But uh, he wanted to give so that, you know, you owed him. You remember that time when I let you use my? Well, now I'd like to use your kind of a thing. Okay, there's people like that. You know it. Uh, if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive... By the way, you understand that because you're kind of like that too. If you're nice to somebody, it's because you're hoping to, to have something come. That's, that's your nature. If you lend to them, that's what the Bible says here. That's why I like this sarcastic passage. If you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? ye sin for sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. In other words, scratch my back, scratch yours is not a Christian concept. Everybody does that. I'll do you a favor, you do me a favor. Right. Everybody does that. But love ye your enemies, and now we're getting to some commands. Love your enemies and do good and lend. And here's the attitude. Hoping for nothing again. Now just, just if, if I have my hand over that passage of Scripture, and it again comes down to the next line. But we want to read that passage of Scripture right up to the semicolon and stop. Because there are two separate attitudes that we're allowed to have as a Christian, but this is the first one we've got to have, and we can't have the other one right if we can't have this one right. The Bible says here, it says, Love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. In other words, the rule, God's rule for a believer, as he loves, lends, and does good. God's rule is do it expecting nothing. Hey, thanks. I'll get to... No, don't worry about it. Don't need anything. Now, I just want to tell you something. There's a testimony issue here. There's not only a heart's attitude issue that's either going to cause bitterness or great contentment in your life, one or the other. But, friend, there is a major contentment issue here. The idea is, God, I'm going to give, and I'm content to have nothing. It's not very difficult to improve on that, by the way. You ever meet somebody, and, uh, you, and, and you realize, you know what, <laughs> you, there's just nothing left to get from this guy. It's funny. I've had people uh, tell me that I, there's different times it's it's happened, and, and I've I've just tried to I'm I'm a you know kind of guy that always offers comfort to people, but I offer it in strange ways, strange sayings. And so somebody comes to me and say, Pastor, I'm in big trouble. Somebody's suing me, and I say, Well, what are you upset about? Well, they're trying to get you know they want a million dollars. Well, where you got your million dollars hidden? Well, I don't have a million dollars. Well, are they gonna get your car? Well, I don't actually own my car. Uh, they can get your house. Well, the bank owns my house. Uh, they can take your job away from me. They can work it. No, I mean, there's, <laughs> they're going to sue you, but you've got nothing. And what are they going to do? <laughs> they're going to get a judgment. I'll never be allowed to have anything. 
let me help you with something. Statistically speaking, you probably never will anyway, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Find comfort in this. I'm going to just tell you something, Christian. The guy that doesn't have anything and is happy with it is far happier than the guy that's trying to hold on to something. Yes, that's true. Amen. And you know, you can have nothing and hold on to it tighter sometimes than a person that has a lot. I've seen guys that, I mean, they just don't want to lose. They don't have anything to lose, and they're not willing to lose it. Mm -hmm. What was it uh, Tom Malone wrote in his autobiography? He wrote a statement that's kind of stuck with me. His grandfather, during the Great Depression, was reading the newspaper, and I think it was Roosevelt, that was saying he was going to take away poverty. And he told his family, he said, I can't remember his wife's name, but he says, sweetheart, he said, if they take away our poverty, he said, we ain't going to have nothing. <laughs> he said, he said, he said he's going to take away poverty. That's the only thing I've got. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is that, you know, the very fact that he understood that showed his mindset toward Lord, You're not going to take something from somebody who doesn't have anything. And if you as a believer really understand what it means to be a steward for Jesus Christ and to be owned by Christ and have everything that you have belonging to Him, you realize that you've got nothing to lose in this life. Amen. Listen, friend, I want to tell you something. In this life, if you're saved and you're a child of God and you're on your way to heaven, you got that for free. Right. You got it at the expense of Jesus Christ. It's very costly. For Christ to die for your sin, but He paid the payment in full. He offered you the gift of eternal life for free. You received it, and you can't lose it. How about that? You can't give your salvation away. You can share. Right. You say, hey, I got saved, and anybody can get saved, and you're supposed to do that, and you're giving something away, but you can't lose yours. Amen. And for a believer that really has the mind of Christ, he realizes that the only thing that, uh, that he has that he cannot lose is the only thing that really matters because he's not going somewhere that he can take anything else. Yep. I just want to tell you something. Your possessions will look mighty silly in heaven. Yep. Right. Yes. <laughs> you can go down to the Ferrari dealership and get the most costly car they've got there in their showroom, and you could take it to heaven and it'd look junk. Yep. Right. Yes. Look like a pile of trash. Amen. And just be t garbage. They say, what are you doing with that corruptible thing up here? Get that out of heaven. They don't allow sin in heaven. They don't allow Ferraris either. Now, maybe some Corvettes, but not Ferraris. That's right. <laughs> it's good to have your turn to preach. All right. Friend, you can't lose the most important thing you have. Nothing else you have is worth holding on to. Now the scripture goes on to say, if you love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping to for nothing again. Now pay attention to verse 35 in the second portion, and we'll be done just very shortly. The Bible says, your reward shall be great. And your reward shall be great. In other words, give everything you've got. You say, Pastor, you know, are you telling me I should give everything i got? You know, that Harold Camping guy, he told people that the Christ was going to return, and he said for people to give everything they had because Christ is going to return. Are you, are you in a cult like Harold Camping? No, but I think you ought to give everything you got. Amen. Or I'm not going to tell you when Christ is going to return, but I'm telling you that what you've got is worthless. Amen. Yes. And if you're going to hold on to it instead of serve the Lord Jesus Christ, uh -oh. you're holding on to something that's not worth anything at all. I'm going to tell you something. You never gave up anything that was worth anything. This whole idea, and, and I laugh, I, I make jokes about preachers that talk about what they could have been, you know, if they hadn't given their lives to Christ. And I just think, my goodness, <laughs> I don't believe you. You know, uh, what were you before you were saved? I think, I know, this brother, our brother here was probably telling me about somebody told what his salary was. That, somebody told us that. His salary would have been 90000 He made 90000 before he became a preacher. Whatever, he told us salary. And I always think, man, <laughs> that's, that's uh, you know, small potatoes, man. You know, yeah. Now you wonder what I make, don't you? <laughs> a lot. A lot. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I just think, man, you know, you, you worked a job making $90,000 and you think that you gave up something. I just want to let you know, I gave up something to serve Jesus. It was costly for me. I just want to tell you something, Christian. You didn't have anything. Amen. You didn't have anything. You didn't give up anything. 
You didn't have anything at all. But the Bible says, if you give up what you don't have and what you can't keep, the Bible says very plainly, it says your reward shall be great. Now, I'm going to preach prosperity gospel to you this morning, but I want to be on the same page. What's God's blessing? Help us again. God's presence. What do you want? You want to live a life without God or you want to live with Him? You want God's blessing, God's grace? Hey, what kind of church do you want to go to? You want to go to church you feel good and they've got everything you're looking for? Or you want to go to church where God's there? Yes, sir. And God's working. I mean, you walk in the door and uh, you, there's nothing impressive about anything there except God. Mm -hmm. Amen. And all of a sudden you realize, you know what? And people pray, oh, you got to hear the music in that church. And I think, I don't care too. Oh, well, you ought to hear that preacher. And I think, I don't care about him. Amen. You know what you ought to want? You ought to want God. Yes. Amen. Yes, sir. I want to know the Bible. I want to know God's truth. And I'm not interested in comparing to anybody else anywhere. I just want what God has. That's yes. all that matters. The Bible says your reward shall be great and you shall be children of the highest. <laughs> and then that other statement I like. Now, who's, who is verse 35 talking about? Is it talking about the people that get or the people that give? All right? It's talking about, is it talking about you or the people that despitefully use you in all of those things? It's talking about both. Verse, verse 5, 35 says, love your enemies. So it's talking about your enemies. And then it says, do good and land, hoping for nothing again. So who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? You or the enemy? The enemy. You're the good guy. The enemy's the bad guy. Okay? I think I've made that question confusing somehow. The Bible says, though your word shall be great, and ye shall be children of the highest. And then it goes on to say, and this is a blanket statement, I believe, for every category in verse 35. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. I just want to tell you something, Christian. If you won't do what the Bible says about giving, about receiving, uh, having people uh, mistreat you, and taking from you unrightfully and wrongfully, uh, speaking against you, you're unthankful. You're unthankful. So you're in the first category. Uh, you think, uh, i got to hold on to this because I may not have. You're unthankful. You ever felt like you didn't have the right to something? You know, a, a good definition for gratitude is a person that feels like he's got something that he doesn't really have the right to have. As you find a grateful person, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's going to be a person that just feels like, well... I don't deserve this. Right. And if a guy feels like he doesn't deserve something, he doesn't hold on to it mm -hmm. tightly. Right. You ever not want to give something to somebody because they're too generous? You know what I'm talking about? You know, now, there's, there's stewardship and there's generosity, and they're not always the same. I've, I've had people, and I say, you know, I won't give this to you because I know you'll just throw it away on somebody that, and you won't think about it before you give it to them. You know? Um... I've noticed homeless people are a lot of them are generous. Yeah. <laughs> I've just noticed. I mean, they the reason it's one of the reasons they don't have anything is not just because they're alcoholics and drug addicts, but one of the reasons is if you give them enough to make something, they're going to just go squander it. I mean, they're just going to blow it on their friends. They're going to have a blowout because they want people to think, you know, hey, he's really generous, and they like what people think about him. Well, a generous person isn't really a person that just blows things or squanders things. A generous person is a person that's very, very grateful, and he's grateful because he realizes he, says he doesn't deserve to have anything he has. Now, this, state, this statement in the Scripture here says, you're supposed to lend to your enemies, you're supposed to do good, and you're supposed to hope for nothing again, and the reason is because God likes the unthankful people. You think, why does God like them? No, that's not the statement. That's not the question. The question is, why does God like me? Amen. Why is God kind to them? That's not the question. The question is, why is God unkind to me? Yeah. I remember bullies, you know. Bully's a fun term right now. Everything's bullying, you know. It's the big, it's the big trend right now. Everything's bullying. And it, I think it's funny. I wish I could just find the people that are bullying the bullies and bullying, you know. Just, uh, <laughs> just make, make fun. Because this whole bullying thing, is, it's just gotten out of everything's bullying. If, if anybody says anything that they don't like, then you you bullied them, you know. Or if you stand, you know, it used to be if you stood up to the bully, that was a good thing. But now it's bullying to stand up to bullies, you know. And it really, I mean, it's just it's 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 so circular, it just goes round and round and round. And and it's actually it's it's actually kind of kind of funny. 
But, but I've lost my thought talking about bullies, I think. God's kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Right. And you and I, believer, as Christians, have to understand that if God's kind to our enemies, He's also kind to His enemies, and we were once enemies. Amen. That's what the statement says. When you were once enemies, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now it says, here's the conclusion. If God loves them, so should I. If God loves them, so should I. If this is the way God thinks, then this is how I ought to think. You say, Pastor, this isn't the kind of thinking that gets bills paid. And I submit to you this evening, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You're wrong. This is the kind of thinking that gets the job done. Mm -hmm. Be therefore merciful. Why? Because they deserve it? No, because your Father also is merciful. In other words, be generous, Christian. Be thankful. Be thankful because you don't deserve anything. Be generous because that's the way God is. And be merciful. That is not giving somebody what they deserve. Withholding judgment, withholding penalty. Because that's what God did for you. And that's a good reason. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be get forgiven. And now here's our passage of Scripture I wanted to, to look at. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Now we read the, this whole passage of Scripture. That's very, very costly. Very, very costly. But I want to talk to you about the real prosperity gospel. You know, something I've realized is that not all stewards are equal. You may ever realize that not all stewards are equal and not all stewardships are equal. In other words, a steward is one who is a servant. He's never the master, he's always the servant. But he's a servant to whom great things have been committed to his trust. Or to whatever things have been committed to his trust. And of course, last week when we were talking about stewardship, we talked about Joseph. Joseph is a good example of a steward. Every time Joseph was in any situation, great things were committed to his trust. Even when he went to the slammer. They put him in charge there. Let him take care of everything. He was, he, was, he was working for the keeper of the prison. When he went to Pharaoh's house, to the Potiphar's house, he was the head steward for Potiphar. When he went to uh, Pharaoh, he was the only person in the kingdom under Pharaoh. And sometimes stewardships are great, sometimes they're small. The illustration in the scripture would be talents. You know, the one talent, the two talents, the five talents. So how much is committed to them? And then the statement is, to whom much is given, much shall be required. It's a stewardship statement. But something I've realized about stewards is that they're not all equal. They're not all equal. Now, not everybody has the same things given to them. That's what I mean by that. And Christians, you don't need to be worrying about that. I know a lot of Christians that are trying to be equal stewards with other Christians. Their goal is... I want to be an equal steward. I mean, preachers, they don't, they, every time you talk to them, they're in a different church. Why is it? Well, because they're trying to get to the bigger church. You know, they're in this church, and they're just there until, you know, I mean, they're doing their job, but they're looking for better opportunity. And a bigger church will call them, and they'll take that one. And they'll take it all the way to the top because they want to be one of the big guys. You know, and it's funny. You'd say pastor preachers don't think like that. Well, I've met a few who do, and I know it's strange, but it really is It's a possibility. And what they're trying to do is be... Mm -hmm. Big stewards are trying to be big, big stuff. And the reason they're trying to do that is because they're looking at other people that they admire or like or respect or whatever, and they want to be like them. And I just want to tell you something, Christian. You don't need to be looking at another man's ministry. You don't need Amen. to be looking at another man's field. Amen. You don't need to be looking at another man's stewardship. It's not yours. Amen. And God doesn't hold you accountable for it. Right. Yeah. You don't need it. So you ought to just say, hey, God, you can have everything I've got. I... <laughs> I've got a lot, and I don't deserve it. But if you want it, you, I can have it. And I'll tell you something the Bible says here. It says if God takes everything from you, He'll give you what He did to Job. He'll give you it again. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting. It's proportional. So what does that mean? You say, Pastor, you're about to get nutty here. And I am. And uh, I hope you believe it because it's the Bible, and it'll really bless you if you do. I want to tell you something. If you're a millionaire and you give a million dollars, God will give you a million dollars to give. 
It's just the way, I'm just telling you, the Bible says when you give, God gives in the way that you give. Now, it doesn't say that you can give more and have more than you gave. Whereas it says, in the same manner that you gave, it'll be given. So God's told you, you know, whether you're a dollar heir or a thousand heir or a millionaire, whatever you've got to give, you can give it and God will give it back. Same amount. Same thing you have. Whatever you have, God gave you. And I see, Pastor, God never gives more. Yeah, He does give more sometimes. But sometimes we think God's given more because we've just held on to some things and we haven't given them. I'll tell you what God wants from you. Everything. Dr. John Rice used to say it this way. I always liked the statement. Uh, people would ask him, they'd say, Brother Rice, are you telling me that, I, that God... He says, or they would say, Brother Rice, the way you preach, I'm under the impression that God... God, uh, you know, wants wants a whole wallet of a man. He wants his whole wallet. Right. And John Rice would say, "Yeah." He says, "You know," he said, "He says God doesn't just want a man's wallet. He said God wants the pants that the wallet's in." <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "God also wants the man that's in the pants." Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and that's a good way of putting it. And I'll tell you what God wants from you. You can believe it or not believe it, and you'll find out about God's blessing on the basis of whether or not you believe Him. God wants everything from you. And I'll tell you what he'll give you if you give him everything. He'll give you everything you've got. Again and again and again. Brother, how many cars you say you've given away? You counted it? 26. 26 cars. Brother Spears given away 26 cars in his lifetime. I've given away a lot of cars too. Um, I, need, I, need to I need to think about this a little bit. <laughs> well, let's, let's use your illustration. works better than mine. Okay. Brother Spears given away 26 cars. How many have you had given to you? About that many. About maybe that many, right more. there. Yeah, maybe a few more. I want to tell you something. Uh, there have been, I'm not, I'm not trying to brag you. I'm not trying to have you say, oh, Pastor, you, you wouldn't be impressed with, with things that I, that I could do uh, anyway. But there have been many times when I've given everything I've had. Yeah. Many times. Just given everything I had. I'm talking about everything I had. You say, Pastor, now you had money in the bank. No, I'm talking about I gave everything I had. And I've never been without. That's right. Amen. I never have had nothing. And it seems like I've always had maybe just a little more, but the promise isn't more. The promise is you get just as much as you had. And I just want to tell you something. If a guy that's got a dollar can afford to give everything he's got, then why couldn't a guy that's got $1,000 give everything he's got? Mm. Just practically speaking, if a guy with a dollar can do it, why can't a guy with a thousand? Well, Pastor, you got to understand dollar amounts. You know, do the math. It's a lot different. You know, it's a lot harder. No, um, ask the Federal Reserve. <laughs> there ain't much difference between a dollar and a thousand. They just print whatever. <laughs> and all joking aside, if God is who He says He is and who we found Him to be, He's got a lot more ability than the Federal Reserve. And I believe that one of the reasons the church has not done the job she should be doing in missions and reaching the lost for Christ. I just want to say this. I'm glad that God is saving people. And I, I, I'm, I'm happy to be alive today. I'm not one of these, oh, we're in the last days. It used to be a lot harder. When I, was, when I was in Bible college, all the old preachers would tell me it was a lot easier when we were young. You're, you're in for a hard time, Sonny. I mean, they just always told me that. And I just, well, you know, I mean, back back in the day, you know, I mean, just a lot was happening. It just seemed like everybody's getting saved and ministry was a lot easier and so on. And honestly, if I believed them, I'd believe that God just doesn't work like He used to. I mean, just just can't... I mean, it's the last days, folks, and, uh, you know, it, the numbers are trickling down. You know, you read the prophets, and, and there are guys that were prophets, like Isaiah, and they saw some pretty good years. And Isaiah had access to the courts of the king. He was a relative. He had some bad years, but mostly he had some pretty good years. Then you read a guy like Jeremiah, and every time he ever did anything, he got thrown in a pit or beat up. He's always crying. <laughs> and they were rough on him. He had some bad years. He had a hard ministry. But I just want to tell you something. Jeremiah knew God was good. Amen. And God was every bit as capable of giving His Word through Jeremiah as He was through Isaiah. 
And sometimes we think, oh, what are we going to do if times get bad? I tell you what we'll do, same thing we will always do. We've always done, we just trust God. And just give. And just serve God. And it'll be the same in every time. You know, as I was looking around the world here uh, on this map, you know, you look at portions of, of, the, of the country and areas, and I'm thinking a lot of it over here in the Middle East, in, uh, like Iran and Iraq. and uh, Boy, there have been a lot, of, a lot of Christians killed for preaching the gospel in Iraq lately. Right. And uh, in, 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 in Iran and a lot of these things that are happening over there. And I'm going to just tell you something. The gospel is going forward in those countries like it never has before. Amen. And it has nothing to do with the climate. It has nothing to do with whether or not it's easy or whether or not the, the government's for it. Whether or not the times are good. The times are terrible. And they're preaching the gospel and people are getting saved and Christians are getting killed for it and getting stuck going to heaven. The very worst things could ever get in your life would be the very best they could ever be. Amen. And that's the reality for a Christian. So let's finish. Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Okay, now, we were talking about just a uh, horizontal. This is horizontal, right? Vertical, horizontal. Yeah, horizontal. Okay. Landscape. <laughs> we were talking about horizontal relationships. Horizontal is you and your enemies. Could be you and your enemies, maybe like this. They're here and you're down a little bit. But, you know, looking from side to side. And our relationship with them is that they abuse us and take advantage of us and get from us and we're, we just bless them, give to them, and just let them have whatever. Then there's a vertical relationship. And that relationship in this passage begins with the statement that says God is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. <laughs> And so, you're called unthankful and evil, and God's called kind. So, side to side, unthankful and evil, but thank God that the relationship with Him is He's kind, and we're the ones that are unthankful and evil. He knows what He's saying when He tells us how to give. Now, in that relationship, the Bible says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. What's good measure? I think about it this way, you know, the Bible says a false balance is an abomination, but a just weight is his delight in Proverbs. Right. Uh, we were in a scrap, and there was a fella in town that had a scrap yard, and he had a scale on his scrap yard, in his scrap yard, you know, where these trucks drive on, and then when they drive back off it, when they're empty, and they weigh it. And um, we were selling, for whatever reason, we had the kind, we, we did crush mostly cars, so we didn't do just loose scrap. So we were selling some, I don't know, brass or aluminum or copper or something. And my dad was friends with this guy. And so we went in and we were behind, he was behind the desk in the scale room. And we were, he's chatting with him. And my dad's playing around with the guy's scale, just kind of fiddling with it, you know. And there's a magnet on the scale. Uh -oh. And my dad just takes it off and he's picking up metal and all this stuff, you know. And then he puts, he gets done with it and he's just talking to the guy the whole time. He's playing with his magnet. He puts it on the other side of the scale. <laughs> it was a false balance, you see. The guy had a magnet to throw the scale off. When the authorities would come in and check the scale, you know, it would be dead on. But you put the magnet on there, and that did a lot to change people's loads, and it was in the favor of the fellow. Of course, it was in our favor when he put the magnet back on there. <laughs> My dad's one of those country farmers, you know, just kind of doesn't know anything. <laughs> And uh, so it made it, 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 it helped me understand a, a uh, just weight. Sometimes we think if I give to God, what He gives me back is not going to be as good. Brother just gave his, got rid of his regal and God gave him a Le Saber, low mileage. It's better. They're both Buicks, so I mean, comparable. Buicks are wonderful. But one's just as good as the other. I, I'm sorry I'm using you, but it just works. So, um, <laughs> God gives, He doesn't give less. In other words, the idea here is you don't give back less than you gave. You get in good measure. 
So you may be living, you know, at a lower standard of living than some of the other stewards right now. But I just want to tell you something. God's not going to lower your standard. You're afraid if you give, then you're going to lower your standard. What you're really afraid of is that you're not going to get a higher standard. And that's why you're holding on to that which you cannot keep. And the Bible says, you know, give. It shall be given you good measure. And then it says, pressed down. Now let's just, can I get a cup of flour here? So when God returns His cup of flour... He gives a good measure, but then he presses it down. And then the Bible says shaken together. So shake it up a little bit so it'll settle. And then running over. So heaping up. It says, shall men give in your bosom. And then the Bible says, for with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now we always pay attention to this, the way that this is given to us. You give to God. God gives back in good measure. Press down overflowing, heaped in your bosom, like here. You know, so you, you see a guy, maybe he's got a, I don't know, some kind of a basket or something, and he's, he's getting back what, what he gave. So he gave a basket of flour, maybe. And uh, so he measured it out. Well, he goes back to get his flour, and they give back, you know, fill it up real good. And then after that, they kind of pack it down. Well, let's, I can get a little more in there. Pack it down, put a little more. Let's put some more on. It's overflowing. Then Now hold that basket. And they kind of throw it up against you, you know, and kind of fill it up to here. <laughs> so it's, it's more than the basket can hold. And here's how a Christian is that is given to God. He's just kind of like, oh, i got to hold her. I'm gonna, it's going to drop off because I'm, I'm holding so much that I can't keep it all in my basket. Right. You know? And so he's got a problem now. You know what his problem is? He's going to get weighed down with that basket. He's got to give it out. And he gives it out. Because the Bible says, the last phrase of verse 38 says, it says, For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. God says, Give it, and you give. And God says, Okay, you did a good job here. So you don't so you're not left without anything, and he measures it in. And God says, Give, and you give. And so then he measures it in again. And God says, Give, and you give. And he measures it in again. And God says, Give, and you give. And just keeps going on and on and on and on and on. And that's what God does. That's how God does His work. That's how the church supports missions. You ever think sometimes that sometimes when we ask for sacrificial giving, in other words, we ask you to... Sacrificial giving is not giving what you can afford. When we have a sacrificial offering, we say we're going to have a sacrificial offering in our church, we're asking you to give more than you can afford. We're asking you to pray and say, God, how much am I allowed to give? You pray and say, God, uh, I want to get. How much can I can I give? And I, here's what I do. I always think, I wonder how much is more than I can afford. And I, I just like, I personally, I think it's fun because I just like to get a little crazy with it. I think, well, I couldn't afford. I mean, that would be nobody in our church could afford that. That'd be a good number. And I'll ask God to let me give it. And I just want to tell you something. I have never once been in a situation like that where I have not been able to give what I asked God to let me give. And He just kind of showed me something, a number, and it was, just, it was something where, you know, if this happens, God will have been in it. And I did it. And I'll tell you something else. When I did that, I didn't care what anyone else gave. It doesn't matter to me what anybody else gives. Hey, listen, I'm not going to give to make it with you guys. I'm not going to give so that I can be, be comparable. We're not the same. You shouldn't give to give like I do. Amen. We're not the same. We don't have the same. You should give a lot more. <laughs> God hasn't given us the same amount to give. All He wants us to give is everything we've got. And if you give that, then He'll give you to give, to get, to give, to get, to give, to get. And that's exactly what this passage of Scripture teaches, is that everything you give is so that you can get, so that you can give, so that you can get, so that you can give, so that you can get. And you ought to pray to God that when you die, and He takes you to heaven, that you'll be on the give side of the thing, not the get side. Right. I just want to tell you something. I don't have nightmares about it yet, but the more I think about it, the more I probably will sometime. One of the worst things that could happen would be to have a lot of things when you die. Mm -hmm. It just would be terrible. You say, Pastor, you can leave it to your kids. Well, God can't give them anything. 
Hey, I want to tell you something. Leave a heritage with your children. Teach them to love God. Teach them to trust God. And teach them to give. Amen. <laughs> and and uh, I'll be honest with you. If they ever get a hold of that, they're not going to care what you leave them. Amen. You'll never be able to accumulate. If, if, if you leave it to them, then you're just leaving it, them the job of giving. And that's the way a Christian ought to think. And I'm telling you something. That's just prosperity. A believer that lives this way is prosperous. When you start being unthankful and grudging God and saying, God, you know, I've given this and I don't have anything, I want to tell you something. You're wrong. You're wrong. I asked a question a while ago, you ever given and, you know, and then you didn't have anything or you ever given and, and uh, you know what? The truth is, is that you never have. You've never given and had nothing as a result. I want to tell you something. You've never given and had less than you gave. I'm just telling you. You say, Pastor, no, I have. No, you may be on, on, on the giving side of the cycle. You may just have a little left in your basket, and that's all you've got left, but God's waiting for you to empty it out so He can fill it up. Amen. The fact of the matter, Christian, I just want to tell you something. It's true, and you'll never convince me otherwise. God is kind, and we're not after His nature. In other words, the Bible says that we're unthankful <laughs> and we're evil. And you're not on the better side of things than God. You're not on the good guy side. But you can be like Him. You can behave like God and you can please God. And I believe in our ministry. I believe that if we please God, this church will never accumulate a lot. I just think if we're what God wants us to be, we're never going to never going to have a lot of possessions. That's just the way I feel about it. I just don't think that, I'll be honest with you, when I go and I, I see some churches and I just look at the savings account of a church, I think, what in the world are you saving for? I mean, they just, they, they've got, they've got, you know, their six-month emergency fund. They've got their 10-year backup for that. They've got, you know, they've got extra for missions in case they don't. And I always tell you some God gives so you can give. Amen. Yes. And that's the way a church ought to be. And a church that has God's blessing is a church that's just sending it out. Just sending it out. Amen. Blessing, blessing, and blessing. Yep. If you want to see God's blessing, let me ask you a question just in case we never got the point across. If you see God's blessing in a church, what will it look like? What will it look like? Somebody tell me. Huh? What's it look like when you go into church and God's blessing? God's presence. Okay, God's presence is there. I've been to preachers' conferences that I don't go back to, and and they get up and first of all they brag on the host pastor. Boy, God's blessed this preacher. Man, God's used him in a great way. They've just built. They've just built. Look at these buildings we're in, and uh, they've just. And I'll tell you, they're doing this and they're doing that and. And uh, he told me that they've got this much, and God just blessed this ministry. And I just think that's not God's blessing. Those are buildings, not God's blessing. Amen. Hey, listen, you can go all over town and look at blessing if that's blessing. Amen. I'm going to tell you, some of the biggest buildings on Federal Highway are these ones with the purple lights down the street. God's not blessing. I'm, I'm just trying to make a point with it. It's a little extreme, but I hope you understand. Tall and broad doesn't mean God's blessing. A fat Amen. bank account doesn't mean God's blessing. Amen. Amen. God's presence means God is blessing. Amen. And that's all you need. And as a church, I want to tell you something. If He gave you anything, He gave it to you to give, so you could get, so you could give, so you could get, so you could give. And that's why you have. And if you've got it, you need to be figuring out how to get rid of it. I'm not talking about being irresponsible and foolish. Pay your bills. Live in a way that's a good testimony before men. And give everything God's given you. I'm a, you know, we've, we've, we've used finances for it, but you're not a giver if you only give money. Amen. You're not a giver. You're, you're not serving God if all you give is money. That's right. <laughs> I go door to door from Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. 
I just want you to know that we'd really like to have you come to our church. We'd like you to be a visitor in our church. We want you to come. We also, more important than that, we want to make sure that you know you're going to heaven. Oh, well, you know, um, I'm just really not into church anymore, but let me give you something. Let me, let me, you know, I, I don't go to church anymore, so I haven't given a tithe in a long time. I, you say, Pastor, I'm serious, I don't know how many times I've had people offer me money on door to door. Yeah. It's really funny. Let me give you something. Yeah. And, uh, and they want to give me, I say, no, I, I, you can't do that. I don't take money. And uh, if you give you, the only way we take your money is if you come to church and put in the offering plate. We can't take, really, I can't give it in? No, nope, you got to come to church. Can't give it any other way. It's the only way we take it. I don't need people's money. We go Christmas caroling, and we want people just to know that that uh, Jesus was born, and that's why we go Christmas caroling. We take our float and go through the go uh, through the neighborhood with the lights on and people singing, Brother Chris Bellerin, and uh, having a great time. And people follow us down the street. But a lot of people they come, we give them a, we give them a gift and we sing at their house, and then they want to give you a donation. No, we're not taking donations. We don't. Listen, I want to just tell you something. Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church doesn't need money. We just don't. You say, Pastor, um, do you know what that building remodel is going to cost? <laughs> I'm just telling you something. What we need isn't money. We need God's presence. We need God's presence among us. And I just want to tell you something. God's people will give, and God's work is doing God's work. Then it will just give and give and give. And its giving is going to be outdoors, not indoors. A lot of preachers think about giving like, you know, this way. You know, bring it in here and then let me see if I can figure out a way to get my hands on it. Those are our hirelings. Yeah. And so as we're praying in the next few weeks and looking for God to give us a vision for missions and what He wants our church to do, one of the things that I just want to tell you about is that we just need to be giving. One of, what we want to do, what we're looking for is a way to dispense. Ultimately, it's the gospel we're dispensing. That's what we're giving out. We need to find ways to do it. We need to find ways to do more. Do the same thing we do and do more. Give more. We need to figure out a way to have a better turnaround time on our giving. You know? I mean, it'd be like this, you know? <laughs> you know? Like, the, like there's a fire to put out, and there is. People are going to hell. Your bucket brigade, you got to give fast, you got to give now. You got to do as much as you can while you can, and God will, God will just keep giving back. And you want to go faster, you're not faster than He is. Okay, we're going to finish up. I'm not going to have an invitation this afternoon. I told you I'd preach short, and I, I think I did. That was a short message compared to Brother Spears earlier. <laughs> I'm sorry. And, and I really am because the people here know that they're fully accustomed to messages the same length as yours was. And I think mine's every bit as long. So, if I, if I was being mean, I wouldn't have said it. So, all right. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for what you've done with us this week. Thank you so much for this church. And God, I just really feel like a rich man getting to be in this ministry and getting to be the pastor of people like you've given us. And Lord, I, I know that nothing we have is ours. We're stewards of it. Father, if you want people from this church to go out and do ministry in other places and you just really want to take from us what we have, Lord, we trust you to meet our needs to give us more. Lord, I just ask that every person in this church will be asking you the question, what do you want me to do? God, what do you want from me? God, what do I have? I'm going to give it to you. And Lord, I pray that we would start to see God's blessing that it would be obvious that your presence is here and that you're in it. Lord, I pray that you would help it to be so true that we are in your presence and that we have you with us. That people would no longer be distracted by the peripherals. And they really would come here seeking the Word of God, seeking spiritual things, seeking to grow, seeking to know you, and this would be the place they'd find truth. And they'd find you. We pray that you would work in our hearts. Lord, give us a vision. God, I ask you to be very specific with us in the very near future about how we can do more for missions. Lord, we don't want to have a missions conference and to move away from it and not do anything more. So I pray that you would give us a, show us how and what you want us to do. Help us to be united as a ministry 
to serve You. And Lord, I pray that You would allow us to see Your presence, to see what You can do because of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.